Prince Caspian, Chapter 5 Caspian's Adventure in the Mountains After this, Caspian and his tutor had many more secret conversations on the top of the great tower. And at each conversation, Caspian learned more about old Narnia, so that thinking and dreaming about the old days and longing that they might come back filled nearly all his spare hours. But of course he had not many hours to spare, for now his education was beginning in earnest. He learned sword fighting and riding, swimming and diving, how to shoot with the bow and play on the recorder and the theater of bow, how to hunt the stag and cut him up when he was dead. Besides cosmography, rhetoric, heraldry, versification, and of course history, with a little law, physics, alchemy, and astronomy. Of magic, he learned only the theory, for Dr. Cornelius said the practical part was not proper study for princes. And I myself, he added, am only a very imperfect magician and can do only the smallest experiments. Of navigation, which is a noble and heroic art, said the doctor. He was taught nothing, because King Miraz disapproved of ships and the sea. He also learned a great deal by using his own eyes and ears. As a little boy, he had often wondered why he disliked his aunt, Queen Prunaprismia. He now saw that it was because she disliked him. He also began to see that Narnia was an unhappy country. The taxes were high and the laws were stern, and Miraz was a cruel man. After some years there came a time when the queen seemed to be ill, and there was a great deal of bustle and pother about her in the castle, and doctors came and the courtiers whispered. This was in early summertime, and one night while all this fuss was going on, Caspian was unexpectedly wakened by Dr. Cornelius after he had been only a few hours in bed. Are we going to do a little astronomy, doctor? asked Caspian. Hush, said the doctor. Trust me and do exactly as I tell you. Put on all your clothes. You have a long journey before you. Caspian was very surprised, but he had learned to have confidence in his tutor, and he began doing what he was told at once. When he was well dressed, the doctor said, I have a wallet for you. We must go into the next room and fill it with victuals from your highness's supper table. My gentlemen in waiting will be there, said Caspian. They are fast asleep and will not wake, said the doctor. I am a very minor magician, but I can at least contrive a charm sleep. They went into the antechamber, and there, sure enough, the two gentlemen waiting were sprawling on chairs and snoring hard. Dr. Cornelius quickly cut up the remains of a cold chicken and some slices of venison and put them with bread and an apple or so and a little flask of good wine into the wallet, which he then gave to Caspian. It fitted on by a strap over Caspian's shoulder, like a satchel you would use for taking books to school. Have you your sword? asked the doctor. Yes, said Caspian. Then put this mantle over all to hide the sword in the wallet. That's right. Now we must go to the great tower and talk. When they had reached the top of the tower, it was a cloudy night, not at all like the night when they had seen the conjunction of Tarva and Alambil. Dr. Cornelius said, Dear Prince, you must leave this castle at once and go to seek your fortune in the wide world. Your life is in danger here. Why? asked Caspian. Because you are the true king of Narnia, Caspian the Tenth, the true son and heir of Caspian the Ninth. Long life to your majesty. And suddenly, to Caspian's great surprise, the little man dropped down on one knee and kissed his hand. What does it all mean? I don't understand, said Caspian. I wonder you have never asked me before, said the doctor. 
why, being the son of King Caspian, you are not King Caspian yourself? Everyone except your majesty knows that Miraz is a usurper. When he first began to rule, he did not even pretend to be the king. He called himself Lord Protector. But then your royal mother died, the good queen, and the only telemarine who was ever kind to me. And then, one by one, all the great lords who'd known your father died or disappeared. Not by accident, either. Miraz weeded them out. Belisar and Uvalis were shot with arrows on a hunting party. By chance, it was pretended. All the great house of the Passerids he sent to fight giants on the northern front hill till one by one they fell. Arlien and Irman and a dozen more he executed for treason on a false charge. The two brothers of Beaversdam he shut up as madmen. And finally, he persuaded the seven noble lords, who alone among all the telemarines did not fear the sea, to sail away and look for new lands beyond the eastern ocean. And, as he intended, they never came back. And when there was no one left who could speak a word for you, then his flatterers, as he had instructed them, begged him to become king. And, of course, he did. Do you mean he now wants to kill me too, said Caspian? That is almost certain, said Dr. Cornelius. But why now, said Caspian? I mean, why didn't he do it long ago if he wanted to? And what harm have I done him? He has changed his mind about you because of something that happened only two hours ago. The queen had his son. I don't see what that's got to do with it, said Caspian. Don't see, exclaimed the doctor. Have all my lessons in history and politics taught you no more than that? Listen, as long as he had no children of his own, he was willing enough that you should be king after he died. He may not have cared much about you, but he would rather you should have the throne than a stranger. Now that he has a son of his own, he will want his own son to be the next king. You are in the way. He'll clear you out of the way. Is he really as bad as that, said Caspian? Would he really murder me? He murdered your father, said Dr. Cornelius. Caspian felt very queer and said nothing. I can tell you the whole story, said the doctor, but not now. There is no time. You must fly at once. You'll come with me, said Caspian. I dare not, said the doctor. It would make your danger greater. Two are more easily tracked than one. Dear Prince, dear King Caspian, you must be very brave. You must go alone and at once. Try to get across the southern border to the court of King Nain of Arkenland. He will be good to you. Shall I never see you again, said Caspian in a quavering voice. I hope so, dear king, said the doctor. What friend have I in the wide world except your majesty? And I have a little magic, but in the meantime, speed is everything. Here are two gifts before you go. This is a little purse of gold. Alas, all the treasure in this castle should be your own by rights. And here is something far better. He put in Caspian's hands something which he could hardly see, but which he knew by the field to be a horn. That, said Dr. Cornelius, is the greatest and most sacred treasure of Narnia. Many terrors I endured, many spells did I utter to find it when I was still young. It is the magic horn of Queen Susan herself, which she left behind her when she vanished from Narnia at the end of the Golden Age. It is said that whoever blows it shall have strange help. No one can say how strange. It may have the power to call Queen Lucy, King Edmund, and Queen Susan, and the High King Peter back from the past, and they will set all to rights. It may be that it will call up Aslan himself. Take it, King Caspian, but do not use it except at your greatest need. 
And now, haste, haste, haste. The little door at the very bottom of the tower, the door into the garden, is unlocked. There we must part. Can I get my horse, Destry? said Caspian. He is already saddled and waiting for you just at the corner of the orchard. During the long climb down the winding staircase, Cornelius whispered many words of direction and advice. Caspian's heart was sinking, but he tried to take it all in. Then came the fresh air in the garden, a fervent hand clasp with the doctor, a run across the lawn, a welcoming whinny from Distrier, and so King Caspian the Tenth left the castle of his fathers. Looking back, he saw fireworks going up to celebrate the birth of the new prince. All night he rode southward, choosing byways and bridle paths through woods as long as he was in country that he knew. But afterward, he kept to the high road. Destrier was as excited as his master at this unusual journey, and Caspian, though tears had come into his eyes at saying goodbye to Dr. Cornelius, felt brave and in a way happy to think that he was King Caspian riding to seek adventures with his sword on his left hip and Queen Susan's magic horn on his right. But when day came with a sprinkle of rain, and he looked about him and saw on every side unknown woods, wild heaths, and blue mountains. He thought how large and strange the world was, and felt frightened and small. As soon as it was full daylight, he left the road and found an open grassy place amidst a wood where he could rest. He took off Destrier's bridle and let him graze. He ate some cold chicken and drank a little wine, and presently fell asleep. It was late afternoon when he awoke. He ate a morsel and continued his journey, still southward, by many unfrequented lanes. He was now in a land of hills, going up and down, but always more up than down. From every ridge he could see the mountains growing bigger and blacker ahead. As the evening closed in, he was riding their lower slopes. The wind rose. Soon rain fell in torrents. Destrier became uneasy. There was thunder in the air, and now they entered a dark, seemingly endless pine forest. And all the stories Caspian ever heard of trees being unfriendly to man crowded into his mind. He remembered that he was, after all, a telemarine one of the race who cut down trees wherever they could and were at war with all wild things. And though he himself might be unlike other telemarines, the trees could not be expected to know this. And I see we're starting to run kind of long, so we'll stop here and continue this chapter in the next video. Thank you so much for listening. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. I love you guys. Bye-bye.